before I start, there are two kinds of physicists. Uh, those who believe in God and those who do not. Um, I am one of those who believe in God. Yes. And so everything I do, I start with the name of God. So in Arabic, we say, Bismillah. So, in the name of God. Yes, that said, um, this course is for introduction to classical physics. Okay, it is for those uh, who are in the college for the first time taking physics, uh, engineering, some sciences, physical life sciences, like that. Uh, okay, and uh, I will try because I know some of you have never taken physics before, not even in high school. This is your first physics class. So I will try as much as possible to take you from the very basics to the very um, where we expect you to be. So we go gradually and uh, we develop ourselves until we get there. And it is very easy, you're going to like it, uh, the textbooks might be very bulky and scary, but don't worry, the concepts are very easy to absorb, you just need to practice some problems which will help you with and you'll get, uh, you'll get better. So I'm going to give an outline of what we expect to cover in this course and um, basically we're going to cover, we're expected to cover about say um, 10 to 12 topic or chapters. The first one is the introduction, which is going to be today. And this introduction, we're going to talk about the definition of physics, okay? Define physics. We're going to talk about um, units, physical quantities. We're going to talk about um, dimensions. Orders of magnitudes. We're going to talk about um, uh, uh, measurement. We'll talk about errors and uncertainties. Uncertainties. You know, more like the little of the experimental part of it. But we're going to talk a little bit about all of this uh, put together. Yes. All of this put together and after that we'll move to the second topic we'll talk about um, linear motion which is motion in one dimension just like motion in one dimension okay it's the simplest kind of motion we'll talk about that and then we we'll talk about um, vectors very important for understanding other parts of the physics we're going to talk about uh, vectors Okay, and then we talk about um, uh, Newton's laws, or before then, sorry, we talk about motion in two dimensions. Motion in two dimensions. So this is going to take us to projectile motion. Okay, and then we talk about Newton's laws. This is going to take us some days to cover. Newton's laws is very broad. Okay? It's broken into three parts. It's going to be Newton's first law and equilibrium. Okay? And then Newton's second law and acceleration. Okay? And Newton's third law and gravitation. Yes, so gravitation. Yes. Now, we have this Newton's loss is going to take a while. After we discuss Newton's loss, we'll come back to topic number six, where we'll talk about circular motion. Okay. And after that, number seven, we'll discuss work, energy, and power. Number eight, we'll discuss uh, systems of particles. This is where we talk about center of mass and talk about momentum, momentum and collisions, <laughs> momentum and collisions. And after that, we come to nine, we talk about um, uh, simple harmonic motion, simple harmonic motion, okay? 
Oh, we, we, we talk about what we call oscillations. Oscillations. Okay? And then we come to 10. We are, we, we're going to talk about um, what we call the angular momentum. Yes. Angular momentum is under rigid body rotation. Rigid body rotation. Rigid body rotation and uh, moment of inertia. Moment of inertia. Yes, so. Then we're going to talk about um, um, a little uh, properties of matter a little bit. So we start with um, heat and properties of matter. Not in, not in so much details, just like an introduction. Heat and properties of matter. Okay, and after that, we conclude with the number 12, which is uh, some basics of thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. Yes, so the laws of thermodynamics is just a basic introduction to this last two. And um, this is basically what the physics one, it's called the physics one intro course. Physics one intro course is, uh, is going to take us. Okay, it's going to be basically... All of these uh, together, and today we're going to start with number one introduction. What is physics? What do we study in physics? What do physicists do? You know, what physicists don't do, you know, and things like that. Yes, yes, so now I'm going to start with my introduction. Okay, I'm going to start with my introduction. Yes, so trust me, it's gonna be fun. You guys are gonna like this. You're gonna love physics. Some of you might end up just becoming physicists. Yes, physics is the best. Being a physicist is the best experience ever. Trust me. All right. Now, what is physics? We've been hearing this physics, physics, physics. What is physics? There are different ways to define physics. People have given different opinions right from the beginning that physics studies of physics started. Uh, I'm going to give one definition that is a little broad and uh, kind of more comprehensive than what we usually know. And I'll explain a little bit. So I say physics, first of all, I'll give you a literal definition, okay? Physics literally originates from the Greek word from the Greek word physica physica which means natural or physical natural or physical but technically technically Physics is a branch of science that uses a combination. It combines mathematics, <laughs> observations, and experiments. It combines mathematics, observations, and experiments. Okay? To study the changes, the properties, the interactions, the changes, properties, interactions, and nature of the universe <laughs> the universe as a whole okay okay now I will come to explain this universe later as we go along okay the universe so the changes the properties interactions and nature of the universe okay from the very small the smallest of particles from the very small to the very large, the galaxies, the space, okay, to the very large, 
from the very small subatomic particles to the very large, the planets, the galaxies, the whole cosmos. Yes, so from the very small to the very large, okay? Why do we do that? In order to get a set of rules, okay? We want to get a set of rules that guide this phenomena in the universe, okay? So as to establish, so as to establish fundamental concepts as known facts, as known facts. Yes, this is the major aim of uh, physics and uh, physics uh, has a lot of branches, lots and lots of branches. Especially nowadays, physicists, they, they kind of collaborate with engineers and biologists. Um, even we have medical physics, okay? So I'm going to mention a few, a few branches of physics. A few branches of physics. I was discussing with the Nobel laureate, Kitar, a few months ago, and I told him, can you tell us how we define physics anymore? He said, I don't know how to define physics anymore because physics is evolving. Physics is evolving from just studying the fundamental uh, forces of nature. It has gone into electronics, computer, okay? We wouldn't have quantum finance using quantum mechanics to study finance and economics. So, so you see, physics is evolving. That is why it's interesting. That is why I am happy because I love it. Okay? I love it. You have to love it. You have to love it. Yes, so if you don't love it, you cannot do it. You have to love it. And the aim of the class is to try as much as we can to make you love it. Nice. Now, some people define physics as the interaction between energy and matter and the study of energy and matter yes that is a good definition but now physics like i said has evolved we have antimatter we have dark matter in fact matter itself as we know it of the whole universe is only about five percent dark matter will take us about 25 percent or about 20 percent thereof and then we have dark energy taking the rest of the 70 to 75 percent of the universe. So you see that matter is low. Dark matter, dark energy, we still don't understand what these things are. That is why physics is evolving. We discover new things, we develop, the technology improves, but we take two steps and we discover something, we see three million miles away of things we yet not know, or things that are yet to be discovered. Okay, now, <laughs> okay, branches of physics. Okay, so we have, uh, we have optics, those who deal with light, they study light, they use laser, so we have laser physics in optics. Some people study sound. Acoustics, okay? Then we have those who study astrophysics, astronomy and astrophysics. They study the planets and the dynamics of the planets, okay? Of the outer space, okay? Those who study black hole physics, okay? Those who study quantum physics, and I say quantum physics has lots of diversification. We have quantum optics. We have quantum finance. Yes, yeah, so we have quantum finance. We have quantum gravity. We have um, um, quantum electrodynamics and like that. Okay, people study this field. Then we have where geology meets physics, called geophysics. 
geophysics. Then we have fluid mechanics. Those who particularize their study in fluids and how the properties of fluid uh, are used. Fluid mechanics. Then we have, uh, after fluid mechanics, we have lots and lots of other areas. Nanotechnology. Yes, sir. Medical physics. Using of x-rays and other uh, uh, medium to scan the body. Okay. Ultrasound and the rest. These are all physics tools, equipment, medical physics, nanotechnology. Okay, we have medical physics, nanotechnology. Then we will have electronics, physics, electronics, robotics, physics. Physicists are everywhere. Okay, experimentalists work with the engineers. They do lots of experiment. We have lots of physics uh, experiments going on in CERN. NASA mentioned these places and at the same time we have theorists those who study the math who try to to predict certain things that have not yet been discovered or try to explain some of those things that have been discovered but we don't understand that is what the theorists do and I am a theorist and I love it and I love it because it's fascinating and interesting yes so now Having understood what physics is, I want to tell us what physicists do. Physicists study what we call physical quantities. Physical quantities. Physical quantities. So, what is a physical quantity? Physical quantities. What is a physical quantity? So we say, we define a physical quantity as a number or set of numbers used for the quantitative description. Of the physical property of a phenomenon, a body, or substance, okay, used for the quantitative description of the physical property of a phenomenon, a body, or substance. Can be quantified by measurement is called a physical quantity. A number or set of numbers. These numbers do not come alone. They come with what we call units. So the units are those special attributes of the physical quantities that tells us or that defines uniquely a physical quantity from a different quantity. For example, I look at you and say you are 10. I'm 10? What are you talking about? Am I 10 foot tall? Or 10 feet tall? Am I 10 years old? Did I walk 10 meters? So you have to add the unit to the physical quantity to define that quantity uniquely. Now, we said it can be a number or a set of numbers. Yes. Sometimes we can use three numbers to, differ, to represent the location of an object in three dimensions. The X, Y, Z component. So it could be a set of numbers to represent the displacement or the acceleration or some coordinate system or whatever physical quantity you are talking about. And it must be a physical property of a physical phenomenon. Happiness. It's not a physical quantity. I am sad. It's not a physical quantity. I am crying. It's not a physical quantity. I am hungry. It's not a physical quantity. Because they are not things we can measure physically with devices or apparatus. Those 
psychologists might have their way of quantifying them from analysis and studies of these people, but these are not the business of physicists. So when you are hungry, the physicists cannot help you. When you are sad, the physicists cannot help you. When you are happy, the physicists cannot help you because we cannot quantify your measure of happiness. We cannot quantify your measure of sadness because these are not physical quantities. So what are the physical quantities that the physicists can help you with? Yes, so let's go. Let's look at the physical quantities that we study as physicists. <laughs> All right, we are coming there. We are coming there. Gradually, gradually. So we say to so every physical quantity, we attribute a unit. Which defines it uniquely. Which defines it uniquely or precisely. Yes. So I say 20 meters as distance. So it's the quantity and the unit. The quantity is the number and the unit. Together, okay, we have, we make sense of the physical quantity. Okay? Okay? It's distance or length, we're going to explain more, but I'm just giving an example that we have a quantity and a unit attached together for us to define every quantity from the self. Two hours, so I'm talking about time. Two is the quantity and hours is the unit, so totally they combine together, they find the physical quantity time. So we have types of physical quantities. Types of physical quantities. The first one is called the base of fundamental quantities. The base of fundamental quantities. <laughs> All right. The base of fundamental quantities are seven in number, okay? I'm gonna write here the quantity, the symbol, the unit, the symbol. Then we're gonna talk about the dimensions, okay? The units, the symbol, and the dimensions, okay? So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So this is the physical quantity. It has a symbol. Then we have the unit. It has a symbol. And we have the dimensions. We'll explain more about dimensions at the end of the, at the, end of the class. Okay? Now, one. Length. Some people call it distance. Or you say the breadth or width. The breadth, width, height, altitude. These are all different names of different kinds of length. Okay? The symbol people call A, B, L, B, W, H. It has different symbols. X, Y, like that. Okay? The unit is the meter, small m, meter, okay? The symbol is m, small m. This is called the SI unit, the SI unit, okay? Le système international de unit in France, in Paris, in 1960, they defined all these units to be the standard units for this base of fundamental quantities, okay? Now, the dimension of length is capital L. Please, these are called fundamental quantities. And their units are called fundamental units. Fundamental quantities or base quantities and base units or fundamental units for the base quantities. 
seven fundamental quantities, seven fundamental units. They are not based on fundamental because they are better than others or they are more fundamental than others. It is just because the fundamental or base quantities are those quantities that cannot be further broken down into other constituents. They stand on their own. In fact, other units are derived from them, a combination of them. That is why the second kind of quantities we're going to look at are called derived quantities. They are those derived from a combination of these seven that we are going to talk about right now. Okay? Number two, we have the mass. Symbol of mass is small m. The unit is kilograms. Kg. Okay? Called kilograms. Kg. And the dimension is capital M. And those dimensions, we'll use them later for something very important. Then, number three, we have time. Okay, the symbol of time is small t. Some people use the tau. Okay, the unit is seconds. And the symbol is of the unit is small s. And the dimension is capital T. Okay. Then, we have what we call electric current. Electric current has a symbol capital I or small i. It's measured in amperes, which is capital A, and the symbol for current or the dimension is capital I. Then we have thermodynamic temperature. Thermodynamic temperature, okay? The symbol is small theta, okay? Or, sorry, uh, T or theta sometimes, capital T or theta. And the unit is... Kelvin and it's capital K, okay? And the dimension is capital theta, okay? For temperature. Then we have what we call luminous intensity. That's number six. Okay? Okay, luminous intensity. Okay? The symbol is IV. It is measured in candela. The symbol is CAL. Okay, and for this we use capital um, J. Okay, capital J as the dimension for luminous intensity. Then the last but not the least is the seventh base of fundamental quantity. It is called the amount of matter. Amount of matter. Okay, it has a, a symbol of. A, or amount of matter, so you will call it A, or small n, okay? And then it is measured in moles. It has a symbol of M-O-L, mole, okay? And the dimension is capital N. Yes! So these are the seven fundamental quantities. The seven base quantities. They cannot be decomposed to any other quantity. They stand on their own. It doesn't mean they are more fundamental or more basic than other quantities. Okay? We have the symbol for the quantities. We have the unit for the quantities and the symbol for the unit. Okay? So this is quantity symbol and this is unit symbol. And dimensions, we're going to explain by the end of the class today for us to understand what we mean by dimensions of these quantities. Okay! Now... We are discussing the types of physical quantities. The first one is the base of fundamental quantities, okay? And these base of fundamental quantities, they are the ones that could not be, or they cannot be decomposed further. They stand on their own. Now, we are going to define the derived quantities. That is the second one, the second types of physical quantities, the derived quantities. But before that, I will take a second to define these units. These units are actually standards, okay? There are some standards that we refer to in quantifying this, and they are called the SI units. I'll talk a little bit about the SI units before I move to the derived quantities, okay? The SI units. Okay? So I said, these are the units, okay? They are also called MKS. This for meter, this for Kelvin, 
this for, I mean, sorry, kilogram, and this for seconds, NKS, okay? There's the previously used one, CGS, centimeters, grams, and seconds. They don't use this anymore. They don't use the CGS anymore, okay? They use the NKS. And we have the British units. They use the feet, yards, and mile to calculate length. Instead of the meters, the SI unit. So the SI unit is the meters, seconds, kilograms. And the ones we have there, they are all SI units. So the British people, they use the feet, yard, mile for length. Okay, they use pounds for mass. And they use um, seconds for time. Okay? Okay? So we don't use this CGS or the British units anymore. We use the NKS, the standard one. Okay? That's the convention. And this is the one we're going to use for this course. We're using meters. So hopefully if we have problems in pounds, and we're most likely going to convert to the SI units to solve our problems. Because our results or the answers are most likely going to be in SI units. Okay? So what is the meter? The SI unit meter. In this introduction that I'm doing today, a lot of things are going to be a little bit not clear because we can't teach all the physics in the introduction. So trust me, we won't go too much details. The definitions I'm going to give for these units, they may not be clear what they are. Just note them down. By the time we start studying current, we start studying displacement, we start studying the details of these quantities, the heat, temperature, you will understand more. And they will get clearer. Um, this concept will become clearer to you. Now, the SI units. The meter. The unit of length. Or distance, or width, or height, or whatever. The SI units. SI unit, okay? Okay, of length. So what is the meter? This is the length of the path traveled by a light ray in vacuum in the interval 1 over 2997924588 seconds this is actually the speed of light okay 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 so approximately 3 times 10 to the 8 okay meters per second that's speed of light but that's the value here okay so in this interval the distance a light ray travel is exactly one meter that's how we define a meter okay we'll come to the details later okay so what is the kilogram the kilogram the kilogram is defined is the SI unit of mass, okay? Okay, one kilogram is defined as the mass of the international prototype. Of the international to prototype of the kilogram. What do you mean by international prototype of the kilogram? It is some mass, you know, they usually measure the kilogram as the mass of one liter of water. But then they discover that water has different kind of purities and it's not a good standard to take as a, a mass. So they wanted something very pure, so they constructed some cylindrical mass inside some glass to save it and keep it very clean and, you know, from external uh, effects. So... It's made up of platinum iridium, okay? 90% the material called platinum and 10% the material called iridium, okay? So that material is made exactly one kilograms. That's what is called the prototype. 
okay they have different ones in different countries but that's the prototype okay this prototype is what we use as a reference for measuring kilogram for measuring kilogram the unit of mass now let's look at the unit of time the seconds the seconds what is the seconds unit of time the second the unit the SI unit of time. So what is the second? So one second is the duration of nine one nine two Okay? Periods of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of cesium 133 like I said just wait the period the radiation these are things we'll talk about later I'm just defining this for definition sake and then you should note, okay, as I'm teaching this course, I might make some mistakes, I might misplace some numbers, even some concepts I might not explain well. When you read and you come across such things, always let me know, okay? I'm open to correction. I'm not perfect. I'm human, okay? Good. Now let's define the correct amperes, the SI unit of correct, okay? The ampere, okay, SI unit of correct, okay, one ampere, okay, is defined as that constant current, that constant current which, if maintained, In two straight parallel conductors, of infinite length, of negligible circular cross-section, Placed one meter apart in vacuum would produce a force equal to two times ten to the minus seven Newton per meter of length. Like I said, some of these notations or some of these words might be abstract, but this is what the ampere is, okay? By the time we start talking about current electricity in physics too, we'll discuss more about the ampere and the current, and maybe this definition, when you come back to it of the unit, will make more sense to you. That is the ampere. Now let's define the unit of temperature. The Kelvin. The Kelvin 
the SI unit of temperature, okay? The SI unit of temperature. Unit means one. That is why all of these units are like one second. Then you say 10 seconds, 10 meters. So 10 times one unit becomes 10 of the multiple, okay? Then the Kelvin, one Kelvin is the fraction 1 over 273.16. Of the thermodynamic temperature of the triple point of water. <laughs> what is the triple point of water? We'll come to that. We'll talk about heat. Okay. Then the unit, the mole, the unit. Of amount of substance or called the SI units of the amount of substance okay one mole the unit one mole okay is defined as the amount of substance Contained in a system that has as many entities. By entities, we mean other atoms, ions, molecules, etc. Okay, that has as many entities. As there are atoms in 0.012 kilograms or 12 grams of carbon 12, the atom carbon 12. Okay? So if you have the same atoms as there are atoms or the same molecules or ions as there are atoms in 12 grams of carbon 12, we say you have one mole of that particular entity, atom, ions, or whatever you are made of, okay? Okay, the last of the fundamental units, SI units, is the candela, which is the unit of luminous intensity. Luminous intensity. It's actually the SI units. The SI units of uniform luminous intensity. The last number seven. So one candela is defined as the luminous intensity in a given direction, okay, is the luminous intensity in a given direction of or emitted by a monochromatic light monochromatic light of frequency 540 times 10 to about 12 hertz okay and that has a radiant intensity of 1 over 683 watts in that same direction per steridian. Complicated stuff. We'll come to that, okay? Now, enough of these definitions. Let's, let's go to some other business, okay? I just defined these units for you to know that these units actually have meanings. They refer to 
certain standards or things that we that we know. Okay? Yes, so. Now let's talk about derived quantities. Derived physical quantities. We discussed fundamental physical quantities, seven of them. We defined the units. Derived quantities are those quantities that are a combination of the fundamental quantities. They cannot stand on their own. Okay? Some of them are multiple of one fundamental quantity. Some of them are a combination of one fundamental quantity with another fundamental quantity. For example, area is a multiplication of two lengths. Length times width. They are both lengths. So, it's meters times meters. So, the SI unit of area is meters square. Or meters square. Okay? I forgot to tell you. You know, I have an accent from Nigeria. So, please, bear with me. That is why I try to write most of the things on the board. Okay? Meters times meters, meters squared. Okay, sometimes I might be carried away as a sequire. It's the same, okay? Now, it's a multiple of length. So, area is a derived quantity derived from the fundamental quantity length. A multiple of two lengths gives area. So, the unit of area is meter squared. It is called a derived unit. So fundamental quantities or base quantities have fundamental units or base units. Derived quantities have derived units. Volume. Length times width times height. Meters times meters times meters. The unit of volume is meters cube. A triple multiple of one. Now let's go to a combination of two. Speed. We might not define this yet until later, but just see how the units work. Is defined as distance over time, which is like length over time. So it is meters over second. So this is a derived quantity because it's a combination of two fundamental quantities, length and time. So it's derived from the fundamental. So speed, meters over second, is the derived unit of the derived quantity speed. Density. Density is defined as mass divided by volume. So mass, volume is derived, mass is fundamental. So density is a further derived because it's combining a fundamental and a derived. <laughs> so, and that derived is co for, coming from another fundamental. So it's measured in kilogram over meter cube. Okay? So this is the unit of uh, density. So this can be written as meters per second or meter second minus one. Okay? When you take this up, it becomes minus one. This is kilogram per meter cube or kilogram meters minus three when the meter cube comes up. So we're going to use this. Uh, I'm going to dive into uh, immediately from here. I will dive into what we call the dimension. So we understand how these units, how these units, uh, how these units work. Okay. I'm going to work more on the derived units and the derived quantities. So derived unit force is mass times acceleration. Okay? So mass is kilogram, acceleration is velocity, or well, let's do speed over time for simplicity. Okay? So it's kilogram times meters over seconds. So the unit of acceleration of force. Uh, um, speed over time, meters per seconds divided by one over second. Oh, I forgot about this. Divided by second. So this is speed meters per second divided by time divided by seconds. So it becomes kilogram, which is mass times acceleration meters over second times one over second. So it's kilogram times meters over seconds times seconds. So it's kilogram meters per second squared. So the unit of acceleration is meters per second squared. And kilogram times that is mass times acceleration is the unit of force. So this is what we call the Newton. Newton M. Okay? So the unit of force is Newton. Okay? Okay? In the 
British unit, they call it dime. The old unit. So 10 to the 5 dimes is 1 newton. Okay? But we don't use that anymore. We use the newton. Okay? Then, we have the, the unit of uh, energy. Energy is just force times distance. So it's going to be newtons times meters. Newton meters. So newton meters is a unit called joules. So this is all, newton is a derived unit from a combination of kilogram, meters, and seconds. Okay? And force is a derived quantity from mass, length, and time. Okay? Energy is a derived quantity from force and distance. Okay? And joules is a derived unit from newtons and meters, which is kilogram, meters, seconds. Okay? And in the old British unit, they call it erg. 10 to the 7 erg is 1 joule, but we don't use that anymore. So we just stick to the joules. We have calories, they have different units they use for energy. Calories is another unit, but joule is the SI unit. The SI unit of force is Newton. The SI unit of energy is joules, okay? J-O-U-L-E-S. Okay? One joule. Okay? Here, yeah, joules. Okay. Now, we have lots and lots. Call it potential difference, momentum, mass times velocity, moment. These are all derived quantities and their derived units. Okay? We're going to play around with them when we solve some problems in this topic. Okay? Now, I want to introduce us to understanding these units using the concept of dimensions. So let's discuss dimensional analysis for a little bit. Dimensional analysis. Okay. Dimensional analysis. mention of dimensions. So what is the meaning of dimensions? We said length has a dimension of L, mass has a dimension of M, time has a dimension of T, temperature has dimension of capital theta, current has dimension of I, okay, amount of matter Had dimensions of n and luminous intensity had dimensions of j one two three four five six seven these are the seven fundamental quantities we define dimension with respect to the derived quantities so when we represent the derived quantities in terms of their units replacing the individual fundamental unit from which they were derived in terms of the dimensions. It gives us the dimensions of those derived quantities. So, for example, what is the dimension of area? So, representing derived quantities in terms of fundamental quantities gives us the dimensions of those derived quantities. They can come in powers, different powers, for example, length, sorry, area has meter squared as the unit. So the dimension of area is L squared. So sometimes we put the L in braces like this and say L squared. So when I write a dimension, I assume it is in those braces, okay? What is the dimension of volume? Volume is length times length times length, which is meters cubed. That's the unit. So the dimension will be L Q. Are you getting it now? Just represent the dimension of that particular quantity in the unit. Density is mass over volume. Mass is capital M, volume is L Q. So this becomes the dimension of density, M over L Q or M L to negative 3. That becomes the dimension for density. Dimensions for speed. 
distance over time. Distance is length, L over T, or L, T minus 1. That's the measure for speed. Descent for velocity. Velocity and speed are almost the same, just a simple difference, but they have the same dimensions, L over T, displacement over time, or L, T minus 1, okay? Acceleration. Acceleration is further dividing velocity by time, so it's L over T divided by another T. So it is L over T times 1 over T. L over T squared, or L T minus 2. That becomes the dimensions of uh, acceleration. I know sometimes I might be very fast. Please always try to call me back, okay? Okay? And if you feel you are catching it but it's going a little not so well, you can watch the video at the end later in the house, then if you have questions in the next class, you can ask. Okay. Dimensions. Speed acceleration. Let's look at dimensions for force. Mass times acceleration. We just got, mass is capital M, we just got the dimensions for acceleration to be LT minus 2. So force is just MLT minus 2. Simple. Let's look at momentum. What is momentum? Is mass times velocity. Mass has dimension M, velocity we just got LT minus 1. So momentum is MLT minus 1. Like that. Okay? Let's look at impulse. Impulse is force times time. We just got the force as MLT minus 2 times time t to the 1. So it becomes MLT minus 2 plus 1. MLT minus 1. So you discover that momentum and impulse, they have the same dimensions. That is why when we get there, we say momentum is equal to impulse. Impulse is changing momentum. They are the same. Even if they have different formula, but they have the same units at the end of the day. Okay? 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 Yes. Yes, sir. Now, 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 now. We have dimensions of a lot and lot of things, okay? Dimensions for electric charge, okay? Electric charge over time is defined as electric current, okay? So what is dimension for electric charge? Charge is current times time, okay? Electric current has dimensions I times time T. So I T is the dimensions of electric charge, okay? What is the dimension of specific heat capacity? Specific heat capacity is measured in joules per kilogram per Kelvin or joules kilogram minus one, Kelvin minus one. That's the unit, okay? It is defined as the, 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 the specific capacity is defined as the heat required to raise the temperature of a unit mass by one curve. We'll come down, we'll discuss heat, but we're just working with units now and trying to replace them with dimensions, okay? Joules is the unit of energy. Uh-huh. I have not derived energy yet. The dimensions of energy. Energy is mass, let's say, force times distance is the simplest one. Force times distance. So let's put energy in dimensions. Force is mass times acceleration LT minus 2 times distance, another L, length. So it becomes M L square T minus 2 because L will times L and becomes square. So this is the dimension of energy. Now put that here to get the dimension of specific capacity we call small c. So small c will have joules energy M L square T minus 2 divided by, or well, let me just put them side by side as we have pair. Kilogram m to the minus one as mass Kelvin capital temper theta to the minus one. You see that? Because that's the dimension of temperature. Kelvin. Kelvin here 
is temperature. So the dimension becomes m minus 1, and m will cancel 1 minus 1. So it becomes theta L squared T minus 2. That becomes the dimensions of specific heat capacity. So just put the dimensions in the units or in the definition of those quantities. You will get their dimensions by putting the dimensions of the fundamental quantities that we studied before. Now, why do we need dimensions when we already have units? Well, they are about the same, but dimensions help us a lot. Because it gives us a picture of the quantity itself. Length, L, is easier for somebody to remember than meters. Okay, mass, M, is easier to use in dimensional analysis. I will see why dimensional analysis is important to us in physics. Why is dimensional analysis important to us in physics? Uses of dimensional analysis. Number one, we use dimensional analysis to ascertain the validity of equations. The validity of physical equations. What do we mean? All equations in physics, all equations in physics must be dimensionally consistent. Dimensionally consistent. All equations in physics must be dimensionally consistent. What do we mean by dimensional consistency? I'm going to put some equations on the board. They are going to be very strange to you because we've not done them, but just work with me in the units. That's what I'm doing. I'm playing with units and dimensions. Okay? Later on, we'll understand. And it might not be so clear, but later on, when you come back after studying those, you get them clearly. And if you've taken a physics one course before, this will become an eye-opener for you to understand some of those quantities more. Now, I will write a physics equation, an equation of motion. It says V equals V naught plus A T. It said V is a speed, V naught is initial speed. If V is speed, if the left hand side is speed, all the right hand side must also be speed. This is what we mean by dimensional consistency. Whatever you have on the left hand side must be equal to the right hand side. I cannot have speed on the right hand side. And have distance on the left hand side. They cannot be equal. So speed can only be equal to speed. So V is speed, which is L T minus 1. V dot is initial speed, L T minus 1. Plus acceleration is L T minus 2 times T. So this T we cancel this minus 2. So I have L T minus 1 plus L T minus 1 equals L T minus 1. Yes! This equation is dimensionally consistent. It has the same dimensions everywhere in the left hand side and the right hand side. So even if I add this two, it's not just be a factor twice or that, it doesn't matter, it's just a number. But the dimension is consistent. That is what matters. Okay. For example, to understand this better, that dimensional analysis helps us understand consistency of equation. All physical equations must be dimensionally consistent. I give you another equation. Say so, x equals v naught t plus half a t square. This is another equation of motion. S is distance, L. So if the left hand side is L, length, distance, every other part here must be L. So let's prove that. v naught is L t minus 1 times time t. That cancels minus 1. I have L here. Plus, half is just a number I can ignore. Acceleration is L t minus 2 times t squared, t to the 2. t squared and t minus 2 will cancel again, okay? Minus 2 plus 2, 0. So it becomes L equals L plus L. So the equation is dimensionally consistent. So I give you some equation. I said, is this equation correct? So how can you validate that an equation is correct? You put in the dimensions and see if the right hand side and left hand side are the same. I give an example. Now check if this equation is correct. V equals X T, okay, plus X over T. 
Now let's check. Is this equation correct? Let's see. V is speed, x is distance. We're going to tell you what they are. T is time. So velocity is speed, lt minus 1, in this case, that's a speed, equals xt is lt plus l over t, which is the same as lt plus lt minus 1. This is lt minus 1. So lt minus 1 is equals, this is the only one that is lt minus 1. This one is not lt minus 1. So this equation is not correct. Because the dimensions of the left hand side is not equal to the dimensions of the individual right hand side. So once you put your dimensions in, you can tell if an equation is right or wrong in physics. Is that okay? Is that okay? Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> now let's talk about the second use of dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is very, very powerful. With dimensional analysis, when you understand dimensional analysis a lot, you can even derive equations just by knowing what certain quantities depend on. And I'm going to solve this using examples. So let me give some examples. I'll give like two, three examples on these dimensions and the uses, okay? And then from there, we can uh, move ahead. We can move ahead to orders of magnitude. Finish with orders of magnitude, and then we talk about measurement and on certain things, on certain things and measurement in the experiment, how to get errors and standard deviations and data analysis like that. And that will be the end of the introduction of the class. Okay? Now, let's talk about let's take an example. Example. Find the dimensions of A and B in the gas equation below. So I say P plus A by V squared times V minus B equals RT. So this is a gas equation. P is pressure. V is volume. So T is temperature. And R is some constant. We don't even need the right hand side to solve the problem. Just look at the left hand side. So we're looking for the U. We don't know what A and B is. We want to know what the dimensions of A and B is. I'll start with B. B is subtracted from volume. Only volume can be subtracted from volume. You cannot subtract anything else from volume. So B will have the same dimensions as volume, L cube. I've got the dimensions of B. Simple, as easy as taking a factor. What are the dimensions of A? I have to get pressure. Pressure A over V squared is added to pressure. So A over V squared as a whole is also pressure. And V is volume. So it means, let me get the dimensions of pressure first, and then equate A over V squared to that dimension. From there I can get the dimension of A. Because I know A over V squared will have the same dimensions as pressure. Okay? So pressure is force divided by area. Force is mass times acceleration, mlt minus 2. Area is L squared. So L cancels 1L, so it's ml minus 1t minus 2. That's the dimensions of pressure. Now, that dimensions of pressure, ml minus 1t minus 2 is A over V squared. And V is volume. So it's A over L cube squared, because L cube is volume. So it's A over L6. So A over L to the power 6 is all of this. So what is the dimensions of A? It is just L to the power 6 multiplied all of this. ML minus 1, T minus 2. So this becomes ML to the 5, T minus 2. That becomes the dimensions of A. Just put dimensions. So the trick here is knowing that once you know dimension of 1 and something else is added to that or subtracted from that, it must have the same dimension as that quantity that was added or subtracted from. Is that okay? Now let me introduce you to the second use of dimensional analysis. The second use of dimensional analysis. The use of dimensional analysis, number one is to ascertain the values of physical equations, which we've gone through. Number two 
is to derive equations themselves. <laughs> we use dimensional analysis to derive equations themselves. That's number two, okay? To derive physical relations between quantities or between physical quantities. Okay. Derive physical relations between physical quantities. <laughs> now, I will give you a relation. If I have a simple pendulum of mass M and length L, mass of the bar to the thread, okay? And let's say this system is affected by gravity G. I will say, what is the relationship between the period of oscillation? The period of oscillation, the period means the time it takes to go back and forth once, okay? We call it T, it is like time, a period, okay? If the period of oscillation depends on the length, the mass, and acceleration to gravity of the place where this uh, pendulum is oscillating about a fixed mean position, I want to derive an equation for T, the period, in terms of all this. Dimensional analysis can give me that formula, easily. I just say that the period T is proportional to M, L, and G. So the period T is equal to some constant K, M to power X, L to power Y, G to power Z. So I don't know what powers are those until I put in dimensions, okay? So I know it's proportional to M, L, G with some power. Maybe it's direct proportional, 1, 1, 1, X, Y, Z, 1, 1, 1, or square of M, or cube of G, I don't know yet. So I'll replace each of these quantities with their dimensions. T is period, which is like time, so it's correct T. K is just a constant, M is mass, L is length, G is acceleration, L T minus two to the power Z. So I've replaced every quantity here with their dimensions. Then you see the formula will come out. Let's continue here. You see, this will give me T equals K M X L, sorry, L Y, okay, L Y L Z T minus 2 Z, when the Z goes into the, the bracket. So it becomes K M X L Y plus Z T minus 2 Z. But in the left hand side, all I have is T. I don't have L and M. I only have T on the left hand side. So I can put imaginary L and M and just put them to power zero. So I said this is M zero L zero T one. M zero L zero T one. Okay. This will give me the same thing as T. Because anything to the power zero is one one, it's just one times t equals k m x l y plus z t minus two z. Now I equate coefficients or powers. M is zero on the left hand side. M is x on the right hand side. So x equals zero. X zero. L is zero here. L is y plus z here. Y plus z is zero. T is one here. T is minus two z here. One equals minus two z. So from here z is minus half. So if I put z as minus half here, y minus half is zero, y is half. So I have gotten x, y, z. I put them back in my equation here. I got x, y, z. I put them back in the equation, I get T equals K M X L Y G Z. I go back to the original equation before I put the, so I got X to be zero, L to be, sorry, Y to be half, Z to be, 
minus half. Excuse me. So t is k m to the zero l to the half g to the minus half. So which is m to the zero is one k l to the half g to the minus half is one over g to the half. L to the half is square root of L, 1 over square root of G. K square root of L over G. This is the formula we know for the period of oscillation of a pendulum. We'll prove it in a different way. That T, the period is 2 pi square root of L over G. The mass term disappears. So it, the period does not depend on the mass, actually. The mass doesn't contribute to the period of oscillation of the pendulum. Only the length and gravity G. Experiment is what tells you that this k is 2 pi, okay? But you see how we use dimensional analysis to get that equation just by knowing or by assuming that the period will depend on these things. I'll give another example, okay? Just one last example for the dimensions of how to use dimensional analysis to deduce equations or relationships between physical quantities. Yes, sir. Just one more example. Now we'll assume we have a string attached at two ends, and this string can be plucked, okay? So that it starts vibrating, okay? It starts vibrating like that, okay? So when you plug the string, okay, you plug the string like this, you plug it. So we say there is a tension there, we call F. So let's assume this tension depends on the mass of the string, okay? Okay, and let's assume it also depends on the length of the string, okay, the mass and the length, and let's also assume um, it will also depend on the, uh, no, let's say, sorry, the speed, the speed, the speed of oscillation on the string, yes. The oscillation speed of the string, V, is dependent on the mass of the spring, the length of the string, and the tension in the spring, I call F. Now, we want to get the relationship between the speed of the oscillation to this, okay? Now, we put in our dimensions. So, we say V is equals K, M to the X, L to the Y, F to the Z. V is speed, L, T minus 1, okay? Equals K, M is mass, X, L to the Y, okay? F here is a force, mass times acceleration, MLT minus 2, Z. I expand that out. This is K, M, X, L, Y, M, Z, L, Z, T minus 2, Z. I put them together. M's go together, X plus Z. Y go together, Y plus Z. T is just minus 2z. Another I have here, I don't have m, so I put m to the 0, l to the 1, t minus 1. That's what I have here. Then I equate t minus 1, or m to the 0, mx plus z, so 0 is x plus z. l1, ly plus z, 1 is y plus z. t minus 1, t minus 2z, minus 1 is minus 2z, so z is half. If z is half, I put it here x is minus half. If z is half, and I put it here, y is half. I've got it x, y, z. Okay? Now, I put it back in the original equation, which is this one. I'm just going to do it right here. That v is k, m, x, l, y, f, z. Okay? So it is k, m, x is what? Minus half. m to the minus half. Okay? Okay? What is the next one? L to the y. What is y? Half. L to the half. Okay? And f to the z, what is z? Half. f to the half. So this gives us k, 1 over square root of n, times square root of l, times square root of f. So this gives us 
k square root of f over m over l because m over l we bring l up and put m down and they call m over l mass per unit length so it is k f over mu they call mu mass over length mass per unit length. okay and the square root is for everything because everything has square root so you see that the speed depends on the force divided by the tension divided by mass per unit length this is another formula k is seen to be one experimentally so you can see we can derive formulas using dimensional analysis i might have been a little fast like i said if i'm too fast call me back but go home it's been a long day go home go through these examples try to solve more examples okay okay solve for like centripetal force okay for example solve for centripetal force centripetal force is mass velocity squared mv squared over r so just say if the centripetal force depends on mass velocity and radius now call this force is k m x v y r z put dimension analysis here solve for this you will get that equation Okay, you'll get that equation for centripetal force. So any equation at all you have, just look at how it depends. So if you're working an experiment, you don't know the relationship, but you know something might depend on something. Put whatever you think it depends on. Dimensional analysis, we solve everything out for you and give you the correct equation. It's very helpful in exams. It's very helpful when solving physical problems or in experiments to use dimensional analysis to resolve certain things. Okay, now we are going to move to orders of magnitude. Orders of magnitude. Yes, so orders of magnitude. Start from here. We told you the definition of physics that we study the very small to the very large. Okay, it is very important. The very small to the very large. So I say small, we can have a small um, length, a small time scale and a small mass scale okay okay small length scale small time scale okay length scale will be like the age of the universe age of the universe age of the universe for a time scale it's around 10 to the 18 seconds Okay, and the time of the vibrations of the nucleus, okay, it's about 10 to the minus 20 seconds. So between 10 to the minus 20 seconds to 10 to the 80 seconds. Small, large. Small, large. This is for the universe, this is for the nucleus. Okay? Now, for length, the size of a nucleus is 10 to the minus 15 meters. The size of the universe okay it's about 10 to the 30 meters you see that for mass the mass of an electron is 10 to the power minus 30 around 30 31 kilograms and the mass of the universe is about 10 to the 28 kilograms so we have orders of magnitude okay from small this is not the smallest we have what we call the Planck length and the Planck time that are smaller than this Okay, but we don't observe them physically yet, but we know they are like boundaries to physical observations. We don't want to talk about that. But from 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 15 means you have 15, 0, 0. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 1. This is 10 to the minus 15. Very small. So 10 to the 30 means you have 130 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, up to 30. From very small to very large. So in physics, we have astronomical scales, astronomical units, using units from the mean distance of the Earth to the Sun, or light years. So we use different units, depending on the order of magnitude you're talking about. Are you talking very small, or are you talking very large? So when we are talking very small, or talking very large, instead of writing all these units with all these zeros, we introduce what we call multiples and submultiples of units. Okay? Multiples and submultiples of units. I'm going to start with the submultiples of units. Okay? And I'll explain what it means. It's going to be in terms of a table. 
Okay, in terms of the table. So here, let me write it. Let me wipe this more so we have more space. Let me try and get a marker that's clearer than this one. Something a little darker. Okay. So here I'm going to have serial numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. Okay. Okay, here I'm going to have prefix name. Factor or standard form. Numerical value. Then here we're going to have power of 10. Here we're going to have symbol. Okay. So for the sub multiples of units, they are mean smaller units. When I want to measure small scales, okay, we use this. So the first one I'm going to have is called deci. Okay. Deci is 10 to the minus 1. Okay. It means is 0 0.1. Power of 10 is minus 1. Symbol is D. Centi. 10 to the minus 2. 0 0.01. Power of 10 minus 2. Small c. So if somebody moves, okay, 0 0.1 meters. Instead of saying somebody moves 0 0.1 meters, I say the person moves 1 decimeters. So these names help us to, instead of mentioning all the 0 0.0000 as we see, we just mention the name of that thing and it gives us that power immediately. Okay? Cent, milli, 10 to the minus 3. 0 0.001. So instead of saying 0 0.001, I say 1 millimeters, 1 milliseconds, 1 milli Kelvin, 1 milli whatever. Power of 10 minus 3 milli m, small m. Okay? Then we have micro. Okay? Ten to the minus six. Okay? Micro, I'll write all of them out and write the rest, okay? Micro, nano, 10 to the minus 9. Pico, 10 to the minus 12, okay? Femto, 10 to the minus 15. Arto, 10 to the minus 18, okay? Zepto, 10 to the minus 21 and Yokto 10 to the minus 24. So this is 0 0.123451, 0 0.123456781, 0 0.123456789101. 0 you see, instead of writing all this, I just call it Pico. Okay, nano, nanometers. Okay, one nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. One nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9 seconds. One nanofarad, 10 to any unit at all. These sub multiples, we stay at prefix for that. Okay, femto, 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 1. 18, like that. You just keep adding the zeros. Okay? The power of 10 minus 6, the power of 10 minus 9, minus 12, minus 15, minus 18, minus 21, minus 24. Okay, centi micro has this sign, okay? Nano, pico, femto, ato, zeto, and yukto.
So these are the sub multiples of units. Okay, I'm going to write the other table. Okay, which is the the, the multiple of units, the multiples of units. Okay, it's going to be the same table, but this time around we're going to represent. Uh, let me see if I can write it this. If I draw the other table this way, and then we will take some examples of how to convert from one uh, sub multiple of unit to another sub multiple or multiple of unit. So that table was sub multiple of unit. Now we want to draw another table, and we're going to call this one multiples of units. Okay. Multiples of units. So the same way I did that, I'm going to do this. Prefix name, factor of 10 or standard form, numerical value, the long one, power of 10 and simple. Okay? So serial numbers, prefix name, factor or standard form, okay, numerical value, they will have the power of 10 before the symbols. Alrighty. Symbol. Okay, now, I start with 1, there are also 10, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, this one is called deca, hecto, kilo, okay, mega, okay, giga, okay, Terra, okay. Um, let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me write them down. Deca, ten to the one. It's multiple now. They are larger. Hecto, ten to the two. Kilo, ten to the three. Mega, ten to the six. Giga, ten to the nine. Terra, ten to the twelve. Okay. Okay. So that then we're going to have PETA, which is uh, 10 to the 15, okay? EXA, 10 to the 18. ZETA, 10 to the 21. And IOTA. 10 to the 24. So these are larger ones, okay? Okay? So this 10 to the 1 is just 10. 10 to the 2 is 100. 10 to the 3 is 1,000, like that. 10 to the 6 has 6 zeros in front of it. 10 to the 9 has 9 zeros in front of it. Okay? 10 to the 12 has 12 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 10 to the 15, 15 zeros, like that. So these are large numbers. There are multiples of it. So if I say I travel 1,000 meters, instead of saying I travel 1,000 meters, I say I travel 1 kilometers. Because kilo is 10 to the 3. Okay? 1 kilometers. Is that okay? Okay? I think it's 1L. Like I said, I might miss some of the spellings there, but I think the values are right. Okay, so the power of 10 is 1, here is 2, 3, here is 6, 9, 12, okay, 15, 18, 21, 24. And the symbol here, they are bigger, okay, kilo, mega, giga, tera, peta, exa, zeta, and yuta. They are just like larger uh, uh, upper cases. Okay. So I can convert from one to another. I'm going to take examples on this and see how to convert like kilometers to meters or microseconds to seconds or, or kiloseconds to microseconds or one year to seconds or 
you just have to know this conversion rate and how these conversion rates work. And we're going to take some examples to really demystify and explain uh, most of these. Okay? Yes. Now, we are going to move to the next, which is, uh, we're going to move towards experiments now. We want to talk about measurements, how to measure length and avoid errors. Because for every measurement we do, there is always an error. Okay? There's always an error associated with it in physics. So if I measure the length of the table, I measure the length of the table again, I might get a different value. Yes, so even with the same equipment. It is a fundamental uh, intrinsic part of nature, okay? Called the uncertainty principle. Okay. So it tells you that when you measure that table, when you come to measure that table again, the table you are measuring the second time is different from the table you measured before because the measurement of the table before has affected the configuration of that table. <laughs> it is funny, but it's true. So we're going to discuss uncertainties. We're going to discuss errors in experiment. I'm going to do a little of that. This is a very simple example just to give a concise overview of the whole thing so that when you go home, you go through these videos, you can have something you can refer to to give you uh, little information so you can get more information as you read uh, from the text. Yes, yes, yes. All right. Now I'm going to wipe out the whole board 